Good morning, guys, and welcome back to AP World History. It is our third day of class. Pretty crazy. Um, remember yesterday, we went over civilizations and empires, hence why our opening screen has ancient civilizations and ancient empires. I think it's a pretty cool picture, if I do say so myself. Okay, right, so today should be August 21st, or if you're Orange Day, it will be August 24th. So let's begin. All right, guys, as usual, we are going to start with our agenda. And guess what? Today we're changing things up because today we are starting period one. All right, and guys, remember, period one is the year 1200 to the year 1450. That's 250 years. And a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff is going to happen during the, these couple years, okay? We're gonna look at ancient civilizations. We're gonna look at how they've developed um, and pretty much set the stage for all this trade and all this globalization that's going to occur in period two and period three, and then finally in period four, okay? So guys, we are actually starting the AP World History curriculum today. And as I told you yesterday, even though all that information about empires and civilizations is maybe not technically on, on our AP World History curriculum, it's still very important. All of those characteristics and traits are very important to know. So please keep those in mind, okay? So guys, I'm gonna take attendance and then I'm gonna move on to our meme of the day. Finally, um, I will give you a little bit of a warm up today there are a few things we need to cover, a few little housekeeping things about the course I want to take care of. Then we are going to start unit one, topic one. We are going to go ahead and talk more about that acronym that we discussed yesterday, G Persia. Okay, I knew you guys did that awesome activity, so you should be somewhat familiar with it. And then finally, I'm going to give you a pretty easy day today. So your activity, you're going to do two things for me. You're gonna take a AP World History Geography quiz. Don't worry, don't stress, it's not that hard. I'm not asking you to know every single country in the world, just the basic regions. And I'm gonna need you to sign up to AP, on, to AP Classroom for me, but we'll go over that at the end of class. All right, here we go. So, memes of the day. I know you guys probably don't remember Blockbuster, but this makes me feel very old. And yes, blockbusters exhibited all the traits of ancient civilizations. Everyone spoke the same language of movies. Everyone had the same religion and it was intertwined with the politics. All right, there was definitely a hierarchy of people there who knew the movies best. And monumental architecture, these buildings still obviously exist. Yes, guys, Sumeria is very, very important, but no one seems to know about it. So sad Sumerian noise. <laughs> okay, guys, moving on to our warm up today. So, as I said, at the end of class, you are going to be expected to take a geography quiz. And as I said, it's not going to be that hard. But look, there's some important things you need to know. And that's not every single country in the world. You're not gonna leave my class knowing where Bangladesh or Djibouti or Chad or Palau are, but you are gonna need to know some very general world regions. And why do you need to know this? It's not because we're being a stickler, but because it's gonna be on the AP test, okay? So I think five years ago, there was a writing sample. And on that writing sample, they asked students to talk about the political systems in Southeast Asia, okay? Now, all pretty much all of the students saw, saw Southeast Asia and thought, oh, India, done, all right? And that year, not a lot of people did very well on this writing sample, all right? Because Southeast Asia is different than South Asia, okay? So guys, we have pretty much we're pretty much gonna cover East Asia today. We're gonna to look ex like specifically at China. But guys, you need to know these 14 world regions, all right? And most of them are very easy. Even if you don't 
think you can memorize it. At least if you know north, south, south, east, and west, you can at least kind of figure out Africa, okay? Make sure you know the difference between South Asia and Southeast Asia, okay? There's a very big difference between India, which is South Asia, and Vietnam or the Philippines, which is Southeast Asia, okay? So again, you're gonna need to know this today and it's not that difficult, all right? If you kind of know your directions on a compass, you should be fine. All right, one thing that is kind of confusing is it doesn't really want you to know about Australia and New Zealand. I kind of find that odd, but that's okay. All right, um, I'm gonna move on, um, but if you guys have any questions, make sure to ask in the chat. All right, so your quiz is going to look like this, okay? It's going to look exactly like this. I'm not gonna lie, it was pretty easy to make and therefore it looks a little, uh, looks a little silly and pedestrian, but this is what your quiz is gonna look like. You can take it as many times as you want, um, but I definitely recommend going ahead and memorizing this. Again, because you don't wanna be that student who writes an entire essay about you know, Mon or um, let's see, an entire essay about Saudi Arabia when the question was about East Asia, okay? We got to break down those continents into directions. So that's really important. And those of you who are taking AP Human Geography, you're already ahead of the game. You already know this. But those of you who are not, got to, got to rem remember these important world regions, okay? All right, guys, there is something else that I wanted to go over. As I said on our first day of class, I was not going to inundate you with tons of information all about the course. So I was gonna slowly kind of integrate that stuff into our class, okay? I'm gonna teach you guys the ultimate cheat code for AP World History, all right? As I said to you guys yesterday, we AP World History teachers, we don't have to teach you, we don't have to teach you everything. Okay, at the end of the day, the only things that you have to know as a student for your exam, you, the only thing you really have to know is what College Board wants you to know. And the good news is, is that College Board doesn't want you to know much. They really want you to know the big ideas and they want you to be able to take those big ideas and apply them, okay? So yesterday, we didn't talk about many specific civilizations or empires. We talked about the general broad empires and civilizations. So guys, that's all that College Board wants you to know. But on the test, they might ask you a very specific question about a tiny little empire. But you'll be able to get it because you know the broad idea, okay? So guys, what you're gonna do today, I have made things a lot easier for you. I have taken the unit guides that College Board provides for the students, and I have kind of shrunk them a little bit. I've made them much easier for you guys. So if we were in my classroom right now, I would print these out and I would provide you with one. But unfortunately, we're not at school, so I'm not able to provide you with a unit guide. But what I want you to do is I want you to go onto Canvas. All right, I'm gonna show you guys. I'm gonna make this easier, all right? All right, guys, so we're gonna be on my six period class today. And I am gonna show you guys from here how to get to my files, all right? You're gonna go to files. And you guys are gonna go down here to unit guides, all right? And unit guides, I have broken these down into units, all right? Remember, unit one and unit two are part of period one. Unit three and unit four are part of period two, all right? The course at a glance is also very, very helpful. It pretty much breaks down everything that is expected of you. This is what we're learning about, what, what you'll have your test on. I would recommend printing that too if you can, okay? But today, what I want you to do, if you have access to a printer, I want you to print out unit one, okay? 
This is really, really important. And to me, if I was a student in AP World History, I would be taking all of my notes on this unit guide, okay? Or in a separate notebook, but with the unit guide in that notebook, all right? And here's why, guys. I am gonna teach you everything you need to know straight from this unit guide, all right? I'm gonna give you a little bit more detail because that's important, but I'm not gonna inundate you with tons of information that's not relevant, all right? And look at how kind of neat and fancy these are, all right? Unit one, the name of the unit, and then the topics, okay? What I'm also going to do, and I will show you, is on our PowerPoints, I'm going to break things down and I am going to make sure that you know that every slide that I provide you is going to have a historical development attached to it. And therefore, you should be able to figure out where in your notes something goes, okay? So guys, today we are going to talk about topic 1.1. And you can see that topic 1.1 has two pages, all right? We're gonna talk about a few of these historical developments and then we're gonna finish it in our next class, okay? I hope you guys don't have any questions. Again, I would suggest printing this out, but you don't have to. Just make sure that you always know how to access it. Make sure that, like this is really important guys, your questions on your test are gonna come straight from this historical development, okay? Does that make sense? All right. So guys, I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. All right. All right, guys. So again, if you, if you guys want, you can actually go to the College Board website and print the 200 page version of the, um, like the curriculum that I just showed you. But again, I've made it a lot smaller, a lot easier to print. And I know not everyone has access to a printer and that's okay too. You can kind of convert that PDF to a Word document if you like as well and type your notes. It's up to you. Um, and if not, just be sure to reference it as often as you can. Because again, guys, everything on that guide is going to be on your test, okay? All right, guys, so we are going to start. And as I said to you today, pretty much everything that, everything from here on out, all of my PowerPoints are going to have our topic and our historical development, okay? so. Again, topic 1-1 one one or 1.1 and that first historical development, okay? Now, sometimes I, I don't get them right. And I know last year the students like to call me out on that. I'm pretty sure that this one is 100% correct, but you are welcome to call me out if you like. So guys, today we are gonna start with a very, very critical, very, very critical region of the world, all right? And it's probably a region that many of you have never studied before. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. I had never studied this region until I went to grad school for history. Okay, and it was there that when the, the professors were lecturing about China, I was like, wait, what? What is this? I, 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 don't, I don't understand. So guys, a lot of this stuff is gonna be completely new to you. And that's okay, all right? We're gonna learn this stuff together. But I need you to understand that this is very important. And this is critical. And this is also where you should start taking notes, guys. So guys, this region, as I said, sometimes I call it the most important region. It's not the most important because at the end of the day, everything that we learn in world history is important. But China is one of the most influential, okay? What we're gonna see with China is that other areas in East Asia, all right, are going to be deeply influenced by China, okay? Even today, people in Japan use a system called kanji, which is straight from the original Chinese written language, okay? Same with Korea. Although Korean alphabet has changed a little bit, 
it can still use those original Chinese characters, okay? All right, a lot of religion that came from China was also adopted in Korea and Japan. This region is critical and you need to know everything that I'm gonna tell you today, okay? Why is this region so influential? It's a huge region, guys, and their production of food, all right? They produce so much food. And like we talked about yesterday, lots of food, surplus of food means you can have more and more artisans and craftspeople and scribes, priests, all right? You can have a much bigger and more fruitful society, okay? So guys, as we said yesterday, all right, as I made you guys do that, that G Persia assignment, I hope that that familiarized you with this acronym. So my predecessor, who I took over for last year, she used the acronym SPICE, all right? Social, political, innovation, culture, and economics. But I actually like G Persia better because I think it actually gives us more of an idea about what the society looked like, okay? So guys, some, some of you might be taking notes and you don't wanna write everything down. But what I would definitely recommend is writing out G Persia and for each of the civilizations that we are going to cover in unit one, you should have a G Persia chart, okay? Maybe you like note cards, you should have a letter with each note, note card and each acronym, okay? So go ahead and make sure you familiarize yourself with G Persia. We're gonna talk about G Persia with ancient China, with the Islamic world, with South American societies. So all of these societies we are gonna talk about, we're gonna use this acronym, okay? Make sure you know it. All right, guys, here's another way to kind of understand G Persia. Um, again, my only issue with this one is that for I, I would choose innovation rather than intellectual, um, but whatever, okay? Please, please, please remember this because if you have a writing sample on your test in May that asks you about ancient China, all right, one way you can really remember, one way you can really remember and add information is if you remember, okay, G Persia, hmm. All right, I remember the geography, I remember the economics and I remember the innovations, okay? That's gonna really help you guys. All right guys, so East Asia, all right? This is our geographical region. So when you take that quiz in a little bit, you can know that China is part of East Asia, all right? So China has some of the most fertile land in the world and this really enables it to really, really increase their food production and really have a lot of excess food. And when you have a lot of excess food, you can feed a lot of excess people, okay? As we talked about yesterday with what happens with a surplus of food, your society gets bigger, it gets stronger, and it's going to start to lead to really large populations in China, okay? And not quite as large as China, Chinese population is today, but when you have a lot of food, you can have a lot of population, okay? And also, when you have a lot of food, you can also have stable governments, right? This is important. If you have, you know, two years of food and then three years of famine, the government's probably not gonna be very stable, okay? Guys, this is real important, all right? One of the reasons that Chinese, um, the China is so stable and it has such a good or amazing um, ability to maximize their food production is because of these two rivers right here, the Yellow River and the Yangtze River, okay? Yesterday, when we talked about those ancient civilizations, about how they sort of came out of nowhere in 4000 BC, well, one of those ancient civilizations, and the map cut it off, was kind of right here, all right? Right here. And you can absolutely say that these ancient civilizations kind of, you know, the that sort of root of where they took, they, they, they became powerful, it's because of these rivers, okay? So in China, 
these two rivers are absolutely critical. All right, the Yellow and the Yangtze River. But the problem is, guys, is that while these rivers are really important and they bring so much nutrients, so much soil, so much rice production, and this is really good stuff, guys. This is lots and lots of food production. The problem is, is that the technology is just not quite there in period one, okay? So every couple of years, these rivers completely flood. And when they flood, it's usually a flash flood, all right? And when they flood, they take out entire villages, all right? They take out entire yearly crops, all right? And they kill hundreds of thousands of people. And guys, these rivers are often known as China's sorrow, okay? Lots and lots of people die from these rivers. And yet, they're also the lifeblood of Chinese civilization. Without these rivers, there's not going to be huge food production, all right? So it's kind of like an, you know, yeah, it's really good for us, but also it's really bad for us, all right? And I want you to keep this in mind because these rivers are going to flood a lot. And the Chinese people, um, they're going to create a religious ideology around this flooding, okay? We'll get there, though. Okay, guys, so this little dynasty chart here, you do not have to know it, all right? But I think it's really important. I think it's really interesting to see, okay? Um, has anyone ever been to China? If you have, you know, you might have seen the terracotta warriors. Um, and that part of China, you can, that's all the way back here in the Shang and Zhou dynasties, okay? So a lot has happened in China leading to where the AP World History curriculum drops us in the year 1200, okay? We are dealing specifically with this dynasty right down here, the Song Dynasty, okay? It's kind of at the latter half of the, the Chinese dynasty movies, okay? So guys, what is a dynasty? All right, I know a lot of you maybe have heard the word dynasty in conjunction with like a sports team, all right? So the Alabama football dynasty or the New England Patriot dynasty, okay? It's kind of the same thing, all right? You have a ruling empire um, for a certain amount of years and they're really, really important and critical and then something happens and it changes, all right? So as you can see, guys, the Song Dynasty right here, all right, in the year 1279, that's going to change, okay? We'll talk about that later, but basically it's, it's no different than, oh, let's see, um, when a sports dynasty loses and doesn't win again for quite a long time, okay? So the political situation, again, so we've done geography, now we're on P of G Persia. The political situation is dynastic, all right? And the ruling of China is always going to be done by an emperor. And as we talked about, it's going to be patriarchal. It's going to almost always be a male. All right. And guys, there's, a, there's occasionally a female emperor in history, but those are definitely the exceptions to the rule. What is really interesting about China is that the emperor actually gets to select his successor. So if you look at today, the British monarchy, all right, you have Queen Elizabeth, all right, the next, when she passes on, the crown is going to pass to her eldest son, all right, and then when Charles dies, it's going to pass to her eldest son, and then when William dies, it's going to pass to his eldest son, all right, or if his son was a daughter, it doesn't really matter about gender, but in China, things are different, okay? the emperor actually gets to select his favorite son. And that's important because the emperor has like a crap ton of them, okay? So guys, the emperor usually has, oh, a wife or maybe two, but the emperor of China has this, it's a very interesting cultural thing, all right? So he has something called concubines. So, Pretty much he has a different woman for every night of the year, all right? And even though he's maybe not married to these women, 
if they bear a son for him and he chooses that son, that son could be the next emperor. Okay. So this is a little bit weird, um, but it's kind of interesting, actually. The emperor has that many women um, that, you know, are part of his, what we would call a harem. Um, and it doesn't matter if his, the son that he chooses is his legitimate son, it doesn't matter, all right? And this is one of those things where us in the West, it's hard for us to conceptualize, okay? Okay, guys, so this one's kind of long, all right? But again, you need to be writing this stuff down. All right, this is important. So guys, in addition to having all of the traits of an empire, the Chinese Song Dynasty also has some interesting criteria. All right, so you have the emperor at the top, okay? And as we said, an empire usually has trained bureaucrats that work below him, okay? And these bureaucrats collect taxes, you know, they write reports, they do all the really important government stuff, okay? So how do people become bureaucrats? This seems like a prestigious job, right? Well, this is what's interesting about China, all right? It's, China is a meritocracy. So you could be, you know, a poor farmer who couldn't read, the son of a poor farmer who couldn't read, but if you studied really hard, you too could be in the bureaucracy, all right? So they have something called the civil service exam. And this, come, this comes from this sort of religious ideal called Confucianism. And we're gonna talk about that tomorrow, okay? But these bureaucrats, they have to pass this exam, all right? And this exam is super difficult, all right? What happens is that these people who take this exam, they have to go into a little room for three days and write 11 major essays, all right? It's a very hard exam. It's harder than the AP world exam that you all are gonna take in May. But guess what? If you pass it, it doesn't matter where you were born you could have a very, very good job serving the emperor, okay? You have to be smart, all right? And in China, because of this civil service exam, they're going to take all the smart people, all right? And they're going to make being intelligent a very critical factor in like jobs and who you are, okay? And guys, this system is sometimes known as the bureaucracy of merit. Okay, it's really, really important. And it's a very fair and equitable way. Okay, doesn't matter who your parents are. If you're not smart, you're not getting that job. Okay, guys, so politics. Again, guys, as we said yesterday, um, the, these empires are going to go ahead and take over lands, all right? And what they're gonna do is they're gonna be very tolerant of the lands they take over. So what, what, why, do they, why are they gonna be tolerant? Well, they want these people to pay taxes. They want them to support the emperor, all right? Now this picture right here, this is, this is taken in the 20th century, okay? And this is something called the kowtow. All right, when foreign leaders would come and submit to the emperor, okay? This is really important because this goes all the way back to pretty ancient China, all right? Chinese emp empires taking over other little, little lands, all right? And what they're gonna do is they're gonna be tolerant, but they're also going to force the elites to submit to the Chinese emperor, right, and to the Chinese bureaucrats. And this process is going to survive, all right? This is going to survive and it's going to thrive all the way until the 20th century, all right? Here's what's crazy. In the, the late 19th century, even the British were required to do this to the Chinese government officials, all right? It's pretty crazy to think about. All right, guys, so 
we're going to talk a little bit about religion today and then we're going to cover it much more tomorrow but there's something you really need to know about china or east asian religion okay something that you cannot we cannot finish today without talking about all right and that is called the mandate of heaven now i want you guys to really try for a minute i want you to some of you guys are christians some of you are jews some of you are muslims um some of you practice hinduism i want you to take your preconceived notions about religion and i want you to put it in a corner okay i don't want you to think about it for a second all right Pretend you know nothing about your religion because this is crazy. This is something that's totally different. And I, you guys really have to think about this for a second. So in China, they believe in something called the mandate of heaven. And this is important. This is something that even though I would say today, the Chinese people don't necessarily believe in, it's still something that drives Chinese society, okay? The mandate of heaven, when you see the word heaven, it's not like heaven that we all think of with our Western religions, all right, or our other Eastern religions. So heaven is kind of this nebulous celestial concept, okay? It's not kind of like, you know, God sitting on a white marble throne. It is this idea that the heavens, the celestial bodies, that's them all right there's no like one like big you know big dude sitting on a throne it's just kind of the universe okay so the chinese believe that there's something called the mandate of heaven and basically it is the right to rule so the emperor of china has the mandate all right and what the mandate is is support from the heavens okay so guys, when things are going really well for the emperor, okay, so when Chinese society is very productive with food, all right, when they're having a lot of good trade, all right, when they're conquering other states and making lots and lots of money, everyone says, oh, all right, the emperor obviously has the mandate of heaven. But when the rivers are flooded and people are dying and there's no food, all right, that's when people start to go, huh, the emperor doesn't have the mandate of heaven. We should overthrow him, all right? We should get rid of that guy. So does this make sense, guys? It's kind of hard to understand, but the mandate is this idea, all right? It's this idea that the celestial heavens have sanctified the emperor, that he has divine right. And again, this goes hand in hand with what a civilization is political leaders and religious leaders are, you know, tied together. You don't have to write this dynastic cycle here, but you need to understand what all this is, okay? As we talked about in the beginning of um, the lesson today, the China, China sorrow, right? The yellow and the Yangtze rivers. When those rivers flood and people die, all right, and food sources, lots of famine, that is when people think, hmm, our emperor no longer has the mandate, okay? So the good news about the mandate of heaven is that it really forced the Chinese emperors to constantly rule well, all right? And it forced them to follow the mandate because guess what? If they're overtaxing the people and you know, people are dying or they're unhappy, all of a sudden the people are gonna think, you know what, this guy doesn't have the mandate, let's get rid of him. So the mandate of heaven is kind of this, this ruling system on the emperors. And it's, it's important guys, it's really important. And it explains exactly why things happen in China, okay? We're gonna talk more and more about other dynasties in China. We're gonna talk about the Ming, all right? We're gonna talk about the Qing. And you're gonna see what happens when these rulers lose the mandate of heaven, okay? All right, guys, so as I said, all right, as I said to you, I love college football. I am also a Yankees fan. Uh, I grew up up north, so I'm gonna give you a real world example of the mandate of heaven. 
Okay, and I really like to talk some smack about Alabama, so I'm going to do it that way. So, guys, Alabama right now is probably, I mean, they could be a dynasty or they could not be. doesn't matter. All right. Alabama won all of those national championships. Okay. They have just consistently won for years and years and years. But recently, they've been losing. Okay. Last year, they didn't even make it to the national championship. All right. And over in Alabama, those people are there. They expect national championships. So do you guys remember last year when Alabama lost to Auburn and all of a sudden people, Alabama fans were, hmm, we should fire Nick Saban. All right. We should fire him. We got to get rid of that guy. All right. They didn't fire him, but people were so upset and they thought that Alabama had lost the mandate of, I don't know, the mandate of greatness. Okay. That is an example. And that's a real world example. Okay. The other, another good example is the Yankees. All right. Some of you probably don't follow for college football. Some of you probably don't follow uh, baseball, but just work with me. It's an easy example. So guys, when I was growing up, the Yankees were so good. We won the world series in 98, uh, 2000. Oh my God. We won it so many times, but then we stopped winning it. All right. We won it, I think in 2009, but that was the last time we won it. We didn't win it again last year. So two years ago, because all the Yankee fans were getting really upset that we have not won a World Series when we won so many before that, that they fired the coach, okay? And that is exactly what the mandate of heaven is, all right? People start to get really upset. They start to get a little nervous. Um, all the good times are gone. So they feel like the mandate of heaven has been taken away from the coaches or the leaders, all right, or the players. I hope that makes sense. I hope I didn't make it more confusing for you guys. But again, I told you, I will reference college football a lot. Okay, guys, so economics. So as we talked about, when you have really, really, really fertile farmlands, you are going to have abundant food, all right? And abundant food is going to support large populations. So here's what's going to happen, guys. Around the Song Dynasty, something is going to get imported from Southeast Asia, okay? Something called champa rice, all right? Champa rice is going to come from Vietnam, and it is going to grow very, very quickly. And when a food source grows very, very quickly, that means you can have two annual crops of rice. And what that means is that you're gonna have double the amount of food. And when you have double the amount of food, you can have more and more people. Or you can take this surplus food and you can start trading with other civilizations. All right, so all of this food, this, is, this, is, this signifies that the good times are here, guys, that the mandate of heaven is supporting the, the dynasty, okay? That the emperor has the support of the heavens. So guys, we are gonna talk more and more about these two trade routes when we get to unit two and unit three, but I need you guys to understand that China's relevance in the world is going, to be, is going to be absolutely critical when it comes to trade, okay? Again, guys, China's gonna have all this excess food. And they're also, like other civilizations, they're gonna support monumental architecture. And they're gonna create beautiful artworks, okay? When you guys open up your family's uh, pantry, you're gonna see those fancy dishes that your mom or dad only lets you use at Christmas. That's gonna be China, all right? And the original formula for making those dishes is going to come from this ancient Chinese civilization. All right. All of these luxury goods are going to come out of China and they're going to be traded along the Silk Road and the maritime based trading of the Indian Ocean. Okay. So you're going to see the red is the Silk Road and you're going to see the blue is the Indian Ocean trading. So again, we will talk more and more about these things. The Silk Road is pretty much the answer to everything in this class. 
So keep that in mind. So guys, exports out of China are highly sought after luxury goods, okay? And just like I said, when you open your parents' pantry and you get out those fancy Christmas dishes, those are called China after Chinese porcelain, all right? China's also going to create really fancy silk, okay? Maybe you guys have some silk pajamas. Well, you can thank the Chinese for that, okay? So guys, what they're gonna do, these Chinese dynasties, dynasties are going to, um, they're gonna trade the silk and this porcelain um, and they're gonna trade them for precious metals like silver um, and copper, things coming out of Europe. They're also gonna trade them for textiles or textiles are clothes, okay? They're gonna trade them from, with textiles from South Asia, more specifically India. And they're also even gonna be able to trade with goods coming out of Africa, like ivory. All right? Ivory is kind of the elephant tusks, all right? Old piano keys are made out of ivory. So all of these cities are gonna be very cosmopolitan and they're gonna be centers of important trade, okay? So guys, today we have covered pretty much half of the China G Persia chart, okay? We talked about the geography and we said that China is located in East Asia. We talked about the political situation all right, we talked about a dynastic emperor and we talked about a bureaucracy, which is also a meritocracy because in order to become part of the bureaucracy, you have to take a civil service exam. We talked about the economic situation, all right? Lots of food equals big populations. Lots of rice means you can trade it, okay? And you can start a worldwide trade for luxury goods. And we also touched on briefly the religious situation. All right, we talked about the mandate of heaven. Tomorrow, we are going to talk more about the religious situation. Make sure you understand what the mandate of heaven is, okay? That's really, really important. Tomorrow, we'll also talk about social institutions. We'll talk about innovations. And we'll talk about arts and architecture. Okay, China is very, very important, okay? China is going to be covered in all four of our periods in this class. We will talk about it here in period one, and again in period two, in period three, and period four. So it is very, very influential. And I gotta be honest, guys, I didn't know much about China before my, I went to grad school. So if you have never heard any of this, that's okay, don't worry. That's what this class is for, okay? So guys, I have a really, really easy next part for you, okay? I'm only gonna ask you to do two things, all right? But what I really need you to do, the most important thing I need you to do is join AP Classroom, okay? This is where you're going to potentially be signed up for the AP exam, which you don't have to worry about today. All right, but I need you to go on to AP Classroom and I need you to join my class, all right? This is where you'll be able to get access to questions that might be on the test, all right? It's also going to give you much more resources outside of Canvas. And you are absolutely required to be on AP Classroom in my class, okay? Even if you have no intention of taking the exam, which you should still take it. Right? And after that, you're going to go on to Canvas and do a geography quiz. So what I want you guys to do first is you're going to get your join code. All right. And I have it on this next slide. So you're going to go on to my AP. So those of you who have taken an AP class before, you're already good. Okay. You don't have to sign up or anything. Those of you who have never taken, you do have to sign up. All right? It won't take very long but make sure you put a good email, all right? You don't have to put Muskogee County if you don't check that one. You're gonna enter your join code and you're gonna check the course information. All right, so what you're gonna do guys is you're gonna go on over to, let's see. 
this website, all right? And from here on out, you're gonna get started. I can't really walk you through anything more. Um, so that's gonna be on you guys, okay? I will check tonight um, and tomorrow whether you guys have joined. This is really important, okay? I need you guys to go ahead and do that. And it won't take you long. Um, I should have however many people are in my class, in my class on my AP, okay? You have to do that today, okay? All right, and then, so guys, here is your course information. Please do not sign up for the wrong class. So if you are in my second period class, guys, here's your join code. If you are in my seventh period class, here's your join code. Sign up for it, all right? And then last but not least, and this should take you five minutes, maybe a little more, go on to Canvas, go to modules, you're gonna start period one today, and you're gonna take the AP World Geography quiz. So you can take it as many times as possible until you get 100, but I think you'll be all right, okay? All right, guys, that is all I have for you today. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Again, tomorrow we will finish up China. And as always, um, keep fighting, keep studying, keep, and stay awesome, all right, guys? So you guys have a good rest of your day.